And to my astonishment, I found multiple eyewitness accounts, not all of them just but from lumberjacks or fur trappers, but a few from medical doctors and even a wildlife biologist describing the same puzzling tracks, noises in the night, and sightings of an animal that no one, not even people who spent their lifetime in the forest, could identify. And they all said it was unlike anything they'd ever seen or heard of. And there are enough of these accounts. Hey there, I'm Stefan Kesting, and this is the Strenuous Life Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to have Adam Schultz back on the podcast. Adam was a guest on episode 279 when we talked about his adventures in northern Canada. And Adam has now got two new babies. Number one, he's got a real human baby, so congratulations on that. And he's also got a new book out, uh, which we're going to talk about. But uh, first of all, how's fatherhood going? Oh, it's going very well. It's a new adventure for me, something quite different, but I'm enjoying every moment of it. So it's uh, it's great. I love it. How old's the little guy? He's eight months. Okay. So you managed to write a book in the last year since you did your the adventure that you're writing about while you had a young kid in the house? That's incredibly impressive. Well, I wrote most of the book before he was born. So I just did a little bit of editing and revising afterwards. But yeah, it was a little bit of a challenge, but I like a challenge. (laughs) I'll say, yeah, let's let's edit a book when we're completely sleep deprived. (laughs) So I'm also, I mean, I do want to talk about fatherhood and how that, how you think that might change your adventuring lifestyle. I mean, you've, you've done a ton of adventures in your life some of which have ended up in books, some of which have ended up as articles, I'm sure others of which were, were just in your memory. But you did an adventure last year that you then managed to turn into a book this year. So that's an incredibly quick turnaround in publishing time, isn't it? Yeah, the publishing world tends to move pretty slowly, but I write my books fairly quickly. And partly that's because they're based on my expedition diaries. So I keep a detailed mm-hmm. diary on every journey that I do. And then that becomes the basis for the book. And by necessity, sometimes I'm under a tight deadline. I think probably like a lot of people in a lot of walks of life, I find that if a publisher were to give me a year, I wouldn't really write anything for the first 10 months and then spend the last Mm -hmm. two months writing frantically. So I do better with a tight deadline anyways. But yeah, when I did my journey alone across the Arctic, um, there was a two year interval between the journey and when the book came out. This time it's only 12 months. So I'm pleased that it's uh, about as fast as it gets in the book world. Well, I'm looking forward to the next uh, adventure, which will be in live time. We'll expect you to not only be out there <laughs> portaging, canoeing, fighting off bears, but also uh, writing the, the book as it goes. Huh. I'm sure there's a market for that. So do you keep notes in an actual physical paper journal? Absolutely. If I was at my uh, house behind my desk, I'm at my sister's today uh, because my internet is not fast enough. But if I was at home, I would have behind me a huge pile of uh, old old journals and I... Uh, do it the old fashioned way. I take out an actual journal on all my expeditions and I write with a pen or a pencil inside my tent at night. And I make as many detailed notes as I can about the weather, about the landscape, the rocks, the trees, the plants, the mushrooms, the birds, all of the animals. And I take this, all these detailed notes and those become the basis for the book. Okay. All right. So why don't we talk about this expedition that's the subject of your book? Where did you go? What did you do? Yeah, so that's my new book, uh, which Yay! I have right here, The Whisper on the Night Wind, The True History of a Wilderness Legend. So this book is another wilderness adventure, but it's a little bit different than my others in that it actually began when I was at home in my office, uh, reading late into the night, burning the midnight oil, as they say, doing some research. And I'm always looking into historical records of exploration in the fur trade for inspiration, for coming up with new ideas for expeditions uh, for the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. And on this occasion, I'd been reading the diary of an old fur trapper by the name of Merrick, who was in Labrador. And Labrador is at the northeast end of the continent in northern Canada, uh, facing out towards Greenland. And for the most part, his diary was pretty ordinary stuff. He talked about trapping beaver and chopping firewood and hunting caribou. But there was one entry in the diary that was totally different than anything I'd come across. It immediately made me sit up in my chair and it sent a chill down my spine. Uh, Merrick describes some very creepy encounters with a large animal in the forest that no one could identify. Strange tracks were found in the woods. Uh, In the night, sled dogs would go missing without any explanation. And children reported seeing this strange animal that sometimes moved on all fours and sometimes stood erect on its hind legs that had a white stripe or blaze across the top of its head. 
And there were all sorts of spooky things going on there. So the story was very arresting compared to everything else in the, the diary, which was very ordinary. Uh, but I thought, you know, I've always been a skeptic. So I took it with a very big grain of salt. And I said, at the end of the day, who's to say he simply didn't make this all up? I mean, it makes a great story, but it was 100 years ago in a very remote and isolated place. It's not like there would be any other eyewitnesses around to dispute the facts. Uh, but my curiosity was such that I decided to poke around and do a little research in the archives. Uh, there's not a whole lot of written records from Labrador 100 years ago. I mean, so sparsely inhabited, the entire population might fit into yeah. a high school gymnasium. But I looked at what records had survived. And to my astonishment, I found multiple eyewitness accounts, not all of them just but from lumberjacks or fur trappers, but a few from medical doctors and even a wildlife biologist describing the same puzzling tracks, noises in the night, and sightings of an animal that no one, not even people who spent their lifetime in the forest, could identify. And they all said it was unlike anything they'd ever seen or heard of. And there are enough of these accounts. These are all people who essentially are there because of the animals and they spend all day long interacting with the animals, either hunting them, trapping them, or trying to stop those animals from eating you know, the food that they've gathered. Absolutely, 100%. These are people whose livelihood depends on their knowledge of animal tracks and fur and sounds uh, that they make, and they were all utterly baffled. None of them had ever seen or heard anything like this before. And when I read this, I was like, well, this is totally unlike anything I've ever encountered in all of my research and all of my travels across Canada's wilderness. I mean, I'm sure like you, I've heard my fair share of campfire stories and old legends, but I always took them with a very big grain of salt. You know, I thought uh, you can always explain them. But this one was very different. I mean, it opened up a fascinating possibility for research because there were multiple accounts that could be cross-examined and compared. And you could see areas where they overlapped, some places where they diverged. But there was enough evidence there that convinced me ultimately that there was something that really did emerge from the forest there to terrify uh, these isolated communities 100 years ago, that it was no mere hoax or delusion, not a result of the isolation of people imagining things, that something must have really happened there. And that's what's at the heart of the book. It's a bit of a mystery. This is like a Sherlock Holmes, Agatha Christie whodunit mm. with a sort of a thriller and a twist in the end. But the reader, uh, the pleasure for them is trying to figure it out before they get to the end of the book. So that's how I wrote it. So how did you do the research? I mean, you, you drove to Labrador? Well, the preliminary research was all archival in nature. So it was just going through records. And in the beginning... I thought, well, there's not a whole lot of written records from Labrador. I mean, most fur trappers, they didn't exactly do a lot of writing in their spare time. And those that did, the odds of their diaries surviving from a century ago are pretty limited. But I thought to myself, you know, where could I turn to try to find written records of early Labrador? And Labrador, because it was so isolated and remote, it's like the Alaska of the East. They didn't have any hospitals. They didn't have any pharmacies. They didn't have any doctor's offices. But what they did have were traveling doctors people who would travel sometimes for hundreds of miles by dog sled or in the summer by canoe to provide medical services to these isolated lumberjacks or fur trappers and their families. They would visit the logging camps or the fur trade posts. And uh, some of them did this for over 30 or 40 years, like a lifetime, wandering the wilderness of Labrador, the mountains in the forest. And I thought, you know, medical doctors, they would have kept records. Mm -hmm. So that's where I turned to. And I went through the records of a few different ones, um, Dr. Grenfell, Dr. Patton, uh, Dr. Forsyth. And to my astonishment, because I really wasn't expecting much. And in the beginning, it was very tedious going through these accounts. It was just about delivering babies in the backwoods or giving out medicine or uh, sewing up you know, someone's wound because they'd taken a careless swing of an ax. But to my astonishment, I did find similar encounters to the, what I'd found in the Fur Trapper's Diary with the strange tracks and the sightings. And they were all clustered around one specific area, sort of in the heart of Labrador, near the foothills of what's called the Mealy Mountains, at a place that no longer exists, uh, but it was called Traverse Pine, an old fur trade post that had been founded back in the 1840s, but was later abandoned. And today is just a ghost town. But most of them centered around that area. And they all clustered around a specific time period from about 1909 was the earliest account up until about the 30s, the 1930s, when they just abruptly ended. So it was all within mm. this specific range. And most of those accounts, even though they clustered over several decades, were talking about incidents that had happened over a period of several winters earlier in the 1910s or so. So I found this all very fascinating. It seemed like there was something there, that this was no mere hoax or delusion, and that it actually 
you know, there was a possibility for digging deeper in here and maybe unraveling the mystery. Okay. I, I want to get to the actual sort of fieldwork part of it, but just to jump back a step, how do you find these old, like these old journals, these old uh, accounts? I, I mean, I, if I wanted to find, I don't know, the accounts of a dentist traveling in Alaska in 1895, I would not have the first idea of where to start. So where do you go get uh, specific records for a specific area of a very remote part of the world from a very specific amount, from a very specific time period? A lot of them are associated with universities. Uh, various universities have archival collections and uh, they'll have the records from medical associations. So a lot of that, uh, the stuff that I just referenced in Labrador is actually at Memorial University, which is the only university in Newfoundland and Labrador. And they have a lot of those records there. And some of them have been digitized. Some of them have not been. But when I wasn't doing my adventures and expeditions in the wilderness, I did a PhD in fur trade history at McMaster University. And they were very nice. They said I only had to be on campus one day a year uh, for my community oh, really? meeting. Yeah, the rest <laughs> of the time I could be wherever I wanted out in the wilderness uh, doing my research. So I was really familiar. I mean, I've read in all honesty, I've probably read almost every exploration record ever written on Canada from the Vikings up until the end of the 1800s, like literally over a thousand different accounts. And the, I've been to the Hudson Bay Company archives, which are in Winnipeg, and they have all the Hudson Bay archives going back to the 1600s. And that's absolutely fascinating. So I was really familiar with a lot of these sources anyways, because early Canada was a very sparsely inhabited place. I mean, Canada... Just over 200 years ago, say 1810 or so, the entire population was about 200,000 people. And again, the vast majority uh, didn't make any written records. So it's not, it's not that exhaustive. And once you start digging down into records of 17th, 18th century, 19th century Canada, certain names come up over and over again. And, you know, it sort of leads you into certain areas. So I was really, really, really familiar with a lot of this stuff. Labrador was a little bit outside my normal field of research because mostly I actually focused on Western Canada and the subarctic. But once I got into it, I just started tearing through it and reading for anything that stuck out like a sore thumb, anything different. And sure enough, it did. You know, Dr. Grenfell, I was reading his memoir and he talked about, you know, delivering babies and doing the medical stuff. And I started to despair that I wasn't going to find anything. Then I came to one page in his memoir in which he says, one summer, while visiting at the head of Hamilton Inlet, which is on the coast of Labrador, he says he was on board a ship. They'd anchored there and they would typically anchor in a place for maybe a week or so. And any lumberjacks or fur traders would come out of the woods and climb on board the ship if they needed medicine or something. Uh, but he Penicillin. Said, I need penicillin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, you exactly. do. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, you can imagine. But somebody came on board. He says a Scotch settler came on board the ship to ask his advice about a large animal that had appeared around his cabin. Uh, he said the children had seen it several times peeping about the windows and they described it as looking like a huge hairy man. And he said the tracks were like the cloven hoofs of an ox, the stride of about eight feet. And when I read this, I was like, oh man, that is fascinating because this matches up with some of the other records I found from the prospectors, some people who are looking for gold and some of the trappers and other things in the interior. So yeah, the whole thing was absolutely fascinating. This mystery and the more I dug into it, the stranger it got. But I became convinced that there really is uh, something going on here in the woods in Labrador 100 years ago. So it's amazing how many different cultures have both big giant monster living in the bottom of the lake, whether that's the Loch Ness Monster or Ogopogo here in British Columbia, or have, you know, big hairy man living in the wilderness, whether that's the Yeti or the Sasquatch or the Wendigo. Is, is this a similar kind of myth, do you think? Well, the, I so in my book, I do dig a little into these uh, mythological archetypes, as Carl Jung called them, where cultures all over the world, exactly as you said, seem to have similar folklore or similar legends of things lurking beyond the glow of the campfire in the deep, dark woods. But no, in this case, I would say this is actually quite different. Um, and I do dig into this, and I don't want to give away my whole book, because yeah. as I said, it's kind of an Agatha Christie mystery, yeah, yeah. Who done it? like a game. The of butler play. did it. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. is sort of written yeah. like that, where we go through different theories throughout the book and try to test each one out. But this one is different because it isn't rooted in some sort of ancient tradition. It's a very narrow series of incidents that have a, a definitive start mm. time and then a definitive end time. As one of them says, two winters, mm. this thing was there, then it disappeared. 
Um, so it's not really locked in the same way in, you know, out in your neck of the woods in BC where you've got Sasquatch stories. Like it's not mm. something that's in the wider culture that's always there and year in and year out. It was something with a very clear beginning and a very clear end where it just disappeared. Yeah. And there's nothing well, else like it from Labrador. And it was also very strange. There's certain aspects of this that don't really match any other one. Um, so no, I think as you'll see in the book, there is a there is an explanation, and it when you see it, it's kind of like a light bulb goes on. Oh, it all makes sense. But it's a very narrow, specific incident and timeline of events that happened there in one specific right. place. No, I, I don't want to press you to you know give away the ending. Especially, it's, a, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of a not a murder mystery, but a uh, wilderness mystery. So that's it a, is, a very yes. interesting genre that I've not seen or read much uh, read read much from. So. Well, let's just talk a little bit. I'm assuming you went out there. Yes. I'm assuming you, you being you, you grabbed a canoe at some point and headed inland. Yeah, absolutely. So to tell the story, I thought, you know, there's only so much you can learn from an old archive and through an old dusty explorer's journal. I literally have to go there or else I would never be able to write a book about it. I have to be able to see the same things they saw, smell the same scents in the woods, look at the tracks and get a, a feel for that place and the atmosphere. So I decided that I would go to Labrador and set off into the mountains there and see if I could find any ruins of where uh, all of this went down 100 years ago, any ruins of the fur trade post Traverse Pine, and explore the area and go deeper into the mountains there, maybe go into some of the caves and really investigate. But by the time I made up my mind to do this, it was already late in the year. It was almost September. And I had just come back from a solo expedition near Hudson Bay in the Hudson Bay lowlands. So I didn't have a very big window of opportunity because I wanted to get this done before winter arrived. And I thought to myself, well, for an expedition of this nature, because it is quite different than what I'm used to, it's more of a mystery. Two heads are better than one. So I actually would like to have a partner come with me. And I knew to get there, we'd have to canoe along the coast and we'd have to go inland. It'd be pretty mm -hmm. difficult. So I I looked about to try to find someone on short notice from my list of friends, which isn't the most exhaustive list anyone who'd be willing to just drop everything in three days and set off for Labrador. But most of my friends, they all have families, they all have uh, jobs, and uh, <laughs> they didn't seem very many of them. But I looked, actually looked through my high school yearbook, and when I came upon this one guy, uh, his name was Zach, I, a light bulb went on over my head, and I was like, Eureka, because he was, he, we'd never really been friends in high school. He was a year ahead of me. Um, but I knew that he was a pretty tough guy, that he was an outdoorsy, fishing, canoeing, paddling type of guy in that if anyone was crazy enough to drop everything and set off for Labrador, it would be him because he's kind of like, he reminds me a little bit of you. He's got a taste for adventure and he's done many adventurous things, uh, but he's also a professional athlete. He's, he runs triathlon races and maybe you'll find interesting to know this, but he's also a mixed martial arts fighter. <laughs> so I'm like, this is the perfect guy. If anyone's going to be willing to do this, it'll be him. <laughs> Unlikely to whine too much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I was thinking because I knew the conditions would be pretty difficult there. But I sent him a message out of the blue. I contacted him and I didn't beat around the bush. I just cut right to it. I said, hey, Zach, super short notice, but would you have any interest in setting off on an expedition to Labrador to search for the <laughs> ruins of a ghost town where some sort of monster supposedly haunted it a hundred years ago? Uh, we'd have to be able to leave by Thursday. And <laughs> I did, had no idea what kind of response that would elicit, if I get any response at all. But it took him only seven minutes to send really? a message back. And he just typed one sentence back. He asked one question, and it was a very sensible question. It was simply, how much would this cost? <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that that was an encouraging sign, because mm -hmm. that's surely the mark of a very practical-minded person, exactly the kind of person you want for this sort of project. And I assured him, it would not cost him a thing, at least financially. And after that, it took only... Uh, Fingers, nine... toes, and, uh, <laughs> and broken spirit, I cannot vote for. Yeah, I left that unsaid, but he yeah. was enthusiastic. He was immediately up for it. And that's exactly what I expected, because I knew that he was into sorts of all sorts of crazy adventures, none the, none <laughs> from mixed martial arts to running with the bulls and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So he was in for it. I gave him a list of stuff to pack, and uh, he met me at my place three days later. And then we drove to Labrador 2000 kilometers or so. So and, I have uh, so many questions. Uh, no, I mean, number, number one, how do you trust somebody when you give them a packing list? Because I have on a previous expedition, we were heading North through the Hudson Bay lowlands, the Missinabe. So not super crazy remote, but enough to get in trouble. And, uh, and I was like day eight, we ran into bad weather and I put on my raincoat 
and I watched in horror as they like pulled out a plastic, like a garbage bag that they'd cut a little neck hole and two arms <laughs> hole into, and then K-way jackets. I don't know if you remember them, but they're a super lightweight uh, nylon that's not it's kind of a windbreaker. Yeah, and like, oh my god, like, how, it's like it's a serious Hudson Bay Lowland storm coming in, and now we're gonna. I've got it's my responsibility to stop these three people who basically had the worst rain gear possible to not get hypothermia and die. So how do you trust somebody to like just give them a list and they're not gonna substitute? You know, I'll just go all cotton this time. Well, I tried to give him the most detailed tips mm -hmm. on what he should get on his list, but ultimately I figured he can handle himself and he's responsible mm -hmm. for himself. And then I guess on top of that, we had a very long road trip, about 2,300 kilometers all told yeah. to get well acquainted with each other. Actually, it was on that road trip that I mentioned to him that I'd been on your podcast, given his interest mm -hmm. in mixed martial arts. And he was he told me that he'd uh, watched many of your videos. In fact, he was probably oh. more impressed that I'd been on your podcast than he was by any of the expedition stuff. So, yeah, oh. well, his, his priorities need a need a readjustment. But uh... <laughs> yeah, he asked him lots of technical questions while we we're out there about martial arts. Like, do you think he could mm -hmm. take a bear? Without a weapon, do you have any moves that would work? And uh, I was quizzing him all the time on this stuff. So you will appreciate the humor because this book has a lot of humor in it in which we have some of these conversations and I quiz him about these things. So, yes. Yeah, I, I don't think I could take a bear. That was his answer as well. Yeah. yeah. I said, well, what if you jumped on its back and, you know, give it a headlock or something like that? He thought he would just click at the, would claw the hell out of him with its big claws. So. Yeah. Yeah, is that your assessment? I don't as think well? most. I don't think. Think of how hard it is to control to take a cat that doesn't want to go to the vet <laughs> yeah. and put it into the going to the vet box, whatever the carrier is. You usually come out of that bleeding. So most people can't handle a ten pound cat. Yeah. So now all of a sudden we're magically going to handle a four hundred pound bear? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I don't think it would go well at all. I think that in the olden days they used to have like in Europe bear fights where mm -hmm. they put people in pits with them. But I think they generally gave them weapons, like a spear or a yeah. sword or something. So they had a fighting chance. <laughs> Fair enough. And I mean, our ancestors certainly did hunt bears with spears and bows and arrows and large animals. You know, the, the Pleistocene megafauna. You know, we, we did manage to take down whatever, giant ground sloths or terror birds or mastodons or mammoths. But it was also probably at quite a high cost. I mean, when, you, when they look at the bones of... Paleolithic hunters, there's a lot of breaks in those bones, right? Like it's it's actually a sign that we lived in villages because man, nobody with a femur break that bad would survive unless there was a bunch of people taking care of them or nobody with a, you know, half their skull caved in <laughs> would survive unless there was a village taking care of them. You know, yeah. well, thank you, Thrag. Thank you no. for trying to take down that mammoth. Yeah, life was pretty brutal uh, back in the Stone Age, no question about it. <laughs> so what was the actual trip like? Did you make it to the uh, ruined, the abandoned trappers post? Yes, the yes we did. Trade post? We did. Uh, let me see if I could show you this. So this book actually has color photos. It has more color photos than any of my other books, but I don't oh, know wow. if you can make that out. Yes, yes. So the plot thickens and we set off into the wilderness there. We drove up to central Labrador and then we, we loaded up my canoe, the same canoe I used to cross the Arctic. I considered it my best friend, so I didn't want to leave it behind. And we went uh, across the Churchill River and we set off into the forest there. And I didn't know the exact whereabouts of where it all went down. I just had some old uh, records to go by and they weren't 100% precise, but took several hours of searching on a few different sides of the river. And then eventually we came into an older growing clearing where there was some trembling aspen fluttering in the breeze and some fireweed. We pushed through that. We could barely believe our eyes when we saw the crumbling ruins of the old uh, fur trade post there. And uh, we ended up spending the night there and looking around in the woods for any artifacts uh, before going deeper into the wilderness and up into the mountains eventually. Okay. So the the, the fur trade post had burned down. Because I've, I've come across this more in the eastern Arctic or eastern subarctic where the where it seems like every, every hill gets burned about 50, every 50 to 75 years. The return period of the fires is so frequent that many of the old fur trade settlements are, have just been burned to the ground. Yeah, in many cases that is, the, but not here. No, they probably, um, so it was originally founded in 1840 uh, as a Hudson's Bay Company post, uh, but it was never particularly profitable because it was so far off the beaten track that even in the 1800s, 
it didn't really generate any furs. So by about the 1870s or so, the Hudson's Bay Company abandoned the place and it continued on as an independent fur trade post uh, run by family there, the Michelins, a French Canadian family who drifted up to Labrador a generation or so before. And they continued to operate it. And eventually by the late 1800s, it was a thriving community by Labrador standards. They had four houses. So quite the metropolis. <laughs> and then around uh, the 19... One of them was a church, surely. <laughs> no, I don't think they had a church. No? I think they just had... Okay. Uh, they, but they, obviously, religion was very important to their lives. Their diaries make that clear. But then by the end of the 1930s or so, the fur trade had largely dried up and the place was abandoned. And then in World War II, the Allies actually built um, an air base in Labrador. And that cost a lot of... Uh, depopulation of the fur trade post because almost everyone, the lumberjacks and things moved to the air base that they were building mm-hmm. uh, to get higher paying jobs there in the Second World War. And then uh, that modern community is Happy Valley Goose Bay. So a lot of the little communities were abandoned around that time uh, in the in the World War. So that's when it came to an end about round about then. Yeah, that was because Labrador or Newfoundland Labrador was the closest to to England, basically, right? If you draw a straight line across the Atlantic, I think you get to to Happy Valley Goose Bay first. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can see it really clearly right behind your head because you have that map <laughs> and Labrador is just behind you. Uh, but you can see <laughs> yeah. Labrador juts like pretty far out into the North Atlantic. And mm-hmm. uh, that's why the Allies built the air base there because they could get the their airplanes across to Europe from Labrador. And it continued as an airbase right through the Cold War. Well, let's jump back a little bit. So you're coming back from a solo expedition, and then you realize you've got three days to get ready for this Labrador expedition. How long did you figure the Labrador expedition was going to be? I figured somewhere in the neighborhood of two two weeks to three weeks uh, is all the time we had because it was already September. And we didn't want to be there when it started to snow. Oh, and I remember I had other things on my schedule for October. <laughs> yeah, including being a husband and a father, I'm sure. Well, uh, I wasn't a father my, yet, but my question uh, is, yes. Oh, oh, right, right, because eight months. Okay, so your kid was born in, uh, what is it, November, December? No, January, February, March. February, like that. yeah, okay. February, yeah. Math on the fly. Uh, so you've got three days. How do you get? the food and equipment ready for that. What did you do for food? Are you old school there? Did you just go buy a whole like 25 pounds of black beans and some canned bacon (laughs) or, or did you do all uh, freeze dried food or how do you get ready for that expedition that fast? Well, the funny thing is I do so many expeditions that I didn't even have to go shopping. (laughs) My shopping was just to go to my barn because I have like five, (laughs) four or five barrels, Mm -hmm. plastic barrels that are loaded up with like freeze-dried meals and dried food and energy bars and cliff bars that I always have because I'm always in the middle of planning expeditions. Uh, So I simply said to Zach, look, you don't need to get any food. I have it all. I'll pack all the food for both of us. And I said, are you picky? Are you allergic to anything? Is there anything you won't eat? And luckily he said, nope, I'll take anything. So I just selected his food for him. Like, you're going to be eating some freeze-dried mac and cheese and some of these Cliff Bars. Gave him all the ones I didn't like. Yeah, so I have a, I have a ton of food. And even now, I still have a lot of food just kicking around my house because I do a lot, so many expeditions. And sometimes I end an expedition early or ahead of schedule. So I'll have a lot of leftover because it lasts for so long, right, anyways? So I guess for myself, it's one of two things. Either I'm pretty picky with regards to food or I really enjoy the food production process. You know, drying stuff, thinking about what I'm going to be eating putting it all together. But I get sick and tired of freeze-dried food pretty quickly. You can stomach it for weeks on end? I can stomach it for four months on end. <laughs> yeah. I just eat it because I have to. I don't have a choice. I mean, if I have more time, like when I wasn't doing as many expeditions as I do now, uh, because right now I'm exploring residents at the Royal Canadian Geographical Society. So I, I have a contract to do a certain number of expeditions every year for them. How many do you need to do a year? Uh, I have to do at least two, but that would be the bare minimum. I think four or five is probably more of where I'm aiming at uh, annually. And I've been exploring residents since 2018 and will be for at least several more years. So if I if I'm not so pressed for time, then I have a food dehydrator and I'll dehydrate some of my own food and I'll be more choosy. But if I'm pressed for time, then I just make do with the freeze dried meals. And I've eaten every freeze dried meal out there. My two favorite brands are Alpine Air and Backpackers Pantry. I don't know if you have you tried those ones. 
Yeah. yeah, I find them much better than some of the other ones. There's a couple brands that I won't name that I can't stomach that I think are not good. But of those, of they make a big variety. And there's like, I don't, I guess I, I'm happy having a pretty, pretty repetitive diet because there's like three or four of the meals that they make, like uh, vegetable lasagna and forever young mac and cheese. Those are my main go-to ones. I eat those the most. And then I have a big variety of all the different granola bars that I eat. You know, I have like a dozen different brands that I choose some of the bio bars and protein bars. And then I eat as many wild berries when I'm out there as possible. Depending on the expedition I'll do, I will sometimes do a lot of fishing as well if I have the time for it. Uh, but no, I haven't had any problems. I mean, obviously I'm happy when I complete an expedition and I can eat some real food, <laughs> but I make a, a virtue of necessity and I just put up with it. And I get usually pretty hungry that I'm just happy to eat it. Yeah. Do you lose weight on your expeditions typically? Yeah, I lose quite a bit of weight, but then I don't really have that much weight to lose to begin with. Uh, <laughs> you can mm. see me, I'm pretty skinny. So, um, uh, but I do, I definitely lose weight on my expeditions. Yeah, absolutely. I just did one last month in the Rockies where I was retracing the route of David Thompson, the great explorer, over the Athabasca Pass. And that was pretty rough going because there was no canoeing, just hiking on foot. And we also carried a pack raft getting across some of the, the alpine lakes and things. And I find that I just burn so many calories on those expeditions, especially when it's cold, like there were some snowstorms there mm. that, yeah, even if I'm eating like 4,000 calories a day, I'm still hungry. So I don't know what you eat on your expeditions, but yeah, generally for me, I'm, I'm losing, I'm burning through a lot of calories on any expedition I do. Yeah. I, I'm losing weight. I, I just can't eat enough to keep the weight on. Yeah. It's a hundred percent the case. And I, I assume that that would eventually drop down and, and stabilize at a lower level on a long enough expedition. On your four month expedition, did you eventually, I guess you weren't carrying a, a bathroom scale with you, but do you get a sense that it would have kept on going to zero? Would your weight continue to go down or would it, did you f eventually find an equilibrium? That's a good question. So I found that on that expedition, I actually was at my skinniest point, uh, not at the end of the expedition, but about 75% of the way through, because around the 75% mark, I realized that I was ahead of schedule. So I actually increased the amount of rations mm. I was eating each day because I was confident mm. that I could eat into my food reserves, that I was going to get to the finish line ahead of schedule. So I actually increased the amount of energy bars I was eating per day. And sometimes I would eat two of the freeze dried meals a day, which was a real luxury mm. for me because normally I was rationed to just one a day. Um, so by the end of the trip, I wasn't actually at my skinniest. I started to regain weight and yeah, I think that that is the case that okay. you would sort of burn off everything. And, and I think burning. you'd also done all the up, you'd also done all the upriver stuff. And with the upriver stuff, it's got to burn way more energy than downriver stuff or even fighting your way into the wind. Yep. Yeah. And that was also how I designed my route so that uh, the ending part would be relatively easier and that I would have a clean shot across rivers and lakes to the finish line. So no upstream travel and really not even any portaging by that point. Okay. Uh, let's just go a little bit into your gear. And then I want to talk about the interplay between fatherhood and adventuring. What's your default canoe? You're going on an expedition tomorrow, assuming that not all the lakes and rivers are frozen. What boat are you taking? Uh, well, that's easy. I would take my Novacraft Prospector canoe. It's 15 feet long, weighs 59 pounds. Uh, it was custom built for me by Novacraft uh, four years ago for my journey across the Arctic. Took quite a bit of damage on that journey through all the rocks and the ice, so they repaired it for me as good as new. And uh, it's made out of uh, some hybrid materials and, and nigra fibers and polypropylene fused together with waterproof resin. So that's my go-to canoe. I like how light it is, like 59 pounds is relatively light. Some of the heavier ABS Royal X canoes weigh 70, 75 pounds. So uh, in the 15-foot length, I find is my favorite length. I've used on past expeditions in the Arctic and elsewhere canoes as long as 18 feet, and on the other end of the scale as short as 12 feet, just depending on white water, portaging, whether I'm canoeing on the ocean or big water. Uh, but 15 foot for me is the sweet spot. That's what I really like, kind of the best of all worlds, like Goldilocks, right in the middle. Even with two people. So if it's a short trip and I can get by with just a single food barrel, then I can do the 15 foot canoe with even with two people. But for a longer trip, like in 2019, I did an 800 kilometer trip across the Northwest Territories to the Beaufort Sea. And uh, for that one, I had a partner. So we used a 17 foot canoe, which is my preference. If it's a longer trip with two people, then we definitely need the extra space. Uh, so then I would go up. But because, you know, probably 75, 80% of every trip, uh, all the trips I do are solo, 
my natural sort of way of thinking is solo canoes, 15 foot ones. Yeah, for sure. Okay. A uh, default rain gear. You're going out tomorrow. It looks like it's going to be uh, dodgy weather. It's going to be cold. It's going to be wet. It's been argued that the rain, rain gear is the most important piece of kit you can carry. I probably agree with that. What do you wear? Okay, well, I don't want to scandalize you because sometimes I just take what I can get. I mean, this is my full-time occupation. I don't have any other revenue stream. Yeah. I just make my living from doing expeditions and writing books. So I take what I can get. And uh, right now, my, my reindeer is pretty good. Mech sponsored an expedition I did two years ago. So I have a Mech Gore-Tex jacket. And that is my go-to rain jacket, my Mech one. Um, I've been stretching out for a long period of time a Columbia jacket that I got for free five years ago. They sponsored an expedition I did in the Rockies and let me test out their new line of out, out dry gear. And it's also a waterproof shell. So I use that one, but it's seen better days because it's held together by duct tape in a lot of places. But I love it because it's a really warm rain jacket. So I usually take both of those, uh, the Gore-Tex. Underneath, I always wear Under Armour or maybe not Under Armour, the brand, but you know the other uh, same thing by other companies. Uh, that's always my base layer, thermal, well, warm, warm sort of... Are you talking like a... Yeah, like a, You're warm talking like a, face a layer. thin fleece layer as opposed yes. to like a spandex. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I wear in cold weather canoeing. And then I have over top of it, I only own, I don't own that many clothes. So this is one of my expedition sweaters. It's fleece. I wear this <laughs> over top. And uh, my pants are always the same. They're the pants I have on now. I wear these like seven days a week. These are um, nylon spandex pants and they dry fast. I love them. And then over top of them, I have like a complete waterproof shell, which is my uh, Gore Tex pants. My favorite ones that I've ever owned came from Columbia Sportswear, but they wore out after enough expeditions. They just completely fell apart. And now I have, uh, I forget, it might be Marmot, the ones that I bought last time, but same thing, rain pants. And um, I have waterproof gloves from MSR. MSR? Yes, MSR. And uh, my, my big sort of rain jacket has a hood on it so that covers my toque and I don't have to worry about my toque getting warm. So I'm completely waterproof essentially with my rain jet or my life jacket over top of all that. And if I'm doing a lot of walking through rivers, then I wear actual hip waders. And I've experimented with a whole ton of different waders from neoprene ones with like detachable boots to the cheapest $50 pair they sell at Canadian Tire. And with some reservations, I mostly make use of the cheapest ones they sell at Canadian Tire. That's when I'm like literally just really? walking through rivers. Yeah, because yeah. I find that it doesn't matter what I buy. Like if I buy the expensive neoprene ones that cost hundreds of dollars, they still puncture and get destroyed walking through rapids and rivers. So I'd rather just go on the cheap and replace them. Mm. Just easier on my budget doing it that way. And I also found that I just like the cheaper ones better anyways, because they're way faster to take on and off. And on some of the expeditions I do, I have to take them on and off continuously throughout the day. Like if I'm traveling up some river, yeah. I might be able to pull through some rapids, but then I can't pull. So I got to get down in the current. And I find with the uh, neoprene waders where the boots are detachable, it's a bit of a pain to put them on, lace them up. It takes longer to take them off, take them off. And it adds more weight to your gear when you're portaging because once the boots get wet, they're soaking wet and they add quite a bit of weight to your gear. Whereas the just ordinary plain Jane, old fashioned fishermen's waders don't do that. They're just like rubber boots. So they don't really add any weight even when they're wet. Yeah. Uh, the only downside is that they inevitably puncture on all the expeditions I do. But I find just melting some uh, spruce resin around a campfire and splattering or smearing that onto them does a pretty good job with duct tape or gorilla tape and patching them. Are you concerned at all with the hip waders? The reason I've never used hip waders going up river is I've been worried about water begin. You know, if you're inevitably, if you've got a boot that's 10 inches high, you're going to go into 11 inches of water. If you've got hip waders, that come up to your belly button, you're going to go into your nipples. It's guaranteed you're going to go in deeper than whatever the top level of the waterproof device that you have on is. And and then trying to maneuver up moving water while hauling a boat, while climbing on willow branches up the shore, Yeah. now having the hip waders fill up with water, that seems like a dangerous situation to me. Yes, yes, yes. Well, it happens. It does happen quite a bit. I mean, I've had my waders flood on me dozens of times. And I usually just try to make the best of it and like, oh, now I'm cold. I'll dump these out. Uh, the good thing is, is that they dry fairly quickly, the hip waders, like when I hang them up on rocks or something and let the wind inflate them. But yeah, it happens. But I guess the, um, the pros outweigh the cons to me because the other alternative is, uh, and I, 
experimented a little bit of is when you wear like the full suit, like a complete waterproof shell, full suit. But I always find that that's much too bulky, too warm on many occasions and a real pain to take on and take off because you don't always need it throughout the day. Like if you're just can canoeing down a river or something, then it's less of a concern. But the constant change in mode of travel from poling to portaging to wading to paddling, like, you know, four or five different methods, sometimes every 20 minutes, 15 minutes, it gets a bit cumbersome. So yeah, it's definitely a downside. And as you say, it seems like it always happens that your hip waders get flooded. But yeah, that's what I do. And sometimes, I mean, just seen that sometimes if the water is deeper than my hip, then I can paddle or pull. Um, and if it's shallower, that's right. when I'm waiting. But still, it seems to happen every time that I at least once or twice take a fall. And I fall and then they get flooded. Fair enough. So well, I hope that uh, Columbia, Arcteryx, Marmot, and I don't know, North Face executives are all listening to this podcast and we end up in a bidding war to you know not only get you the very, very state-of-the-art gear of everything that they have, but also a healthy retainer for wearing it and promoting it. <laughs> so uh, I, but on the complete flip side, when you think of the early explorers, when you think of the native people, they were doing all this same stuff. They were traveling up these rivers wearing leather or maybe wearing cotton and, you know, traveling with frying pans instead of titanium pots and traveling with much lighter and more delicate, you know, birch bark canoes. Have you thought of doing sort of a historical expedition to, well, I, uh, uh, you know, traveling with lard and beans and Maybe. I mean, that's, uh, I have, the thought has crossed my mind once or twice, and I've retraced many historic routes, um, working on a book about a lost explorer, and I just did David Thompson's route over the Rockies. And that's something I think about constantly is, wow, they were incredibly tough back in the old days, doing these same expeditions with vastly inferior gear. And uh, when I was doing David Thompson's expedition just this past month, I was crossing some of the rivers up in the, uh, the Rockies that are glacial fed. And the water's freezing cold. And I had to just hike through them. There's a picture on my Instagram. And it looks really extreme. But partly what convinced me to do it is I was reading these accounts. So super cold. Yeah, it's freezing cold. Like unbelievably cold. And very, it looks incredibly dangerous. Because it's like rip-roaring current. Uh, whirlpools and eddies and rapids. And I've got trekking poles and a backpack on walking across. And you could easily lose your footing and get swept away to oblivion. Because it's just rapids and waterfalls downriver. But I was reading these accounts of them doing this in the 1820s, and I only had to do it twice, once on the way in, and then at the end of my expedition, once on the way back. And these guys in the fur trade, in some of the accounts from the 1820s, they did it 27 times in a day, each time with a 90-pound pack, and they were doing it in April. I was doing it in September when it was relatively warmer, but they were doing it when there was still ice along the river shore in like moccasins they didn't even have hiking boots to protect their feet because the river bottom is not sandy it's all like jagged rocks and things and they were doing this like when there was still snow on the ground and at the end of the day like they would go back and forth across the river every which type and they talked about forming like a chain a human chain where the tallest guys would pair off with the shorter guy and they would enter uh, they would rotate back and forth and everyone would link arms so that when someone lost their footing they had like a human chain across the river and they would just carry these packs back and forth in the fur trade and at the end of the day, they didn't even have like an extra pair of dry clothing to look forward to. They'd sleep like in the opens. A few of them might have a canvas tent, but that was basically it beside a sputtering fire. And I'm like, that's incredible. Like it just seems in the 21st century that if we attempted that, we would sure die because like, how do you even, how do they even do that? But I mean, they, they were accustomed to such a hard life um, that even when they were not out in the wilderness, when they went back home to the farm and Eastern Canada, their lives were still hard, right? In the middle of January, mm -hmm. no electricity and no running water, outhouses and all the rest of it. So it was, it's amazing how tough they were. And I always take comfort from that fact. And I actually, you know, I take, I kind of, I guess half the fun is doing it on a budget and not always having the best gear and, and sort of glorying in the fact that, well, you know, people did this with hardly anything centuries ago. So yeah, if they could do it, then uh, I, it doesn't seem fair for me to complain. Which is not to say they had a, an acceptable survival rate by today's standards. I mean, they probably, I mean, I don't know if you set out from, uh, I don't know, York factory in a Voyager canoe with 20 guys, were you always expecting to come back with 20 guys? I'm not so sure. 
No, absolutely not. In my uh, in my book, A History Can in 10 Maps, I talk about the expedition 1820 that set off from near modern day Churchill, Fort Princes of Wales with 20 guys and only nine came back. And I say it's amazing when you read their diaries, how accepting they were of um, taking incredible risks and having people not make it. Almost every major fur trade river in Canada is littered with the graves of voyagers and uh, fur traders and Courier de Bois who didn't make it. So it's a pretty incredible subject. And, and the same would have applied to the native people. I mean, I, I think it would really was feast and famine that in good years, you'd, you'd have lots of kids and you'd expand. And then in bad years, you know, a large percentage of your, your group, your family, your tribe would die. There, there's a lot of evidence showing that, I mean, there's a reason that Canada was sparsely settled <laughs> up until a, a hundred years ago. It, it, your odds of survival were not at all guaranteed and death was pretty common. Yeah, no, absolutely. You're hundred percent correct, especially in the subarctic and the Arctic. Uh, famine was accepted as a fact of life that March was the end of the winter was, were the lean months um, in which you just simply had to accept fasting was a fact of life that you couldn't escape from. And these were probably the greatest hunters in the world. And there just wasn't enough food in the boreal forest or in the subarctic to go around always. And I remember, you know, Champlain talked about that. He was astonished. He described uh, some of the Algonquian hunters as the greatest hunters in the world. Their skill with the bow and arrow was unbelievable. And all of them just said, well, you know, in the winter, we go hungry for a lot of it because they're just, that's the way it is. And it, I guess it's the same for all the apex predators like wolves and other things out there as well, that they, they have to basically endure through that. So I, yeah, hundred percent, that's true. So I've wondered about this, Adam. I don't know if you have any insight. I know that those early voyageurs, those early trappers, they were eating a ton of pemmican. They were eating a ton of meat and fat. And I remember reading years ago a study that talked about rat survival and that rats fed unlimited vegetarian calories and rats fed unlimited uh, meat calories. They'd, they'd basically try to freeze them to death. Poor rats. And the rats that could eat unlimited meat calories would survive longer and have more cold tolerance. So, I mean, I don't eat a lot of meat. I don't eat a lot of meat when I'm out in the bush. But I do wonder if my cold tolerance and my ability to put up with just grinding conditions would be better if I was eating pemmican, if I was eating you know, five pounds of meat and fat a day the way those guys were. Do you have any sense of that? Well, I mean, it's definitely something that uh, people like David Thompson, Alexander McKenzie, Samuel Hearn were deeply interested in. And they talked a lot about this in their diaries uh, from the 1700s, early 1800s, the diet that would be needed to sustain voyagers in the wilderness and what they ate. And they say, you know, it was an astonishing quantity of lard and uh, pemmican that they consumed. And Thompson in particular, you might find his journal interesting because he talks about some of this, that they need meat to stay warm and how many pounds of it they need in a day. And uh, many, many of the Scottish uh, fur traders who came into the fur trade, when they, they, when they saw how much the voyageurs ate in a day on the trail, they were just blown away by it. <laughs> so that's an interesting idea. Yeah. That the meat, the pemmican was keeping them warm and, and fueling them, but uh, it's something they all, they all remarked upon that they ate enormous quantities. And at the same time, Franklin and some of these other early explorers remarked in their diaries about how blown away they were by their, at the same time, their ability to face famine and fasting with such passive, you know, just with stoic resolve that they would accept it. And uh, even acts of heroic self-denial where somebody might have, have saved a couple of scraps of pemmican and uh, distribute them among the group or give them to someone who needed them more. So it's, it's certainly like the diet is some, certainly something that they were super conscious of. And that occupied a lot of their thoughts because it was omnipresent in their mind uh, that they might end up fasting. And how do we fuel ourselves? How do we get enough of it? And uh, yeah, I haven't, I don't know of any specific studies looking at that, but it's an interesting idea for sure. Yeah. Well, hopefully uh, if somebody knows more about that, they'll get in touch with me. And I'm not going to the keto diet. I've tried that. It was a disaster for me, but uh, for, for a different explorer, for people who do well on the keto diet, it might be something to explore. Okay. So. You've been doing four to five expeditions, lots of solo expeditions for a number of years. You're the explorer in residence for the Canadian Geographical Society. And you also have a kid and you're also married. So how do you balance those things? How do you say, you know, honey, uh, it's March. The rivers are uh, 
thawing. There's, you know, the spring freshet is happening and I'll see you in October. Is, is that the negotiation process? No, it's more the other way around. It's uh, March, the rivers are thawing. And my wife says, honey, the rivers are melting. It's time you go <laughs> for four or five months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's amazing. Sometimes I say, uh, you know, I'm, I feel guilty because I have like an idea for a three month expedition and I'm, I'm keeping it all bottled up inside me and not sharing it because I feel half guilty about it for like a week or two. And then I propose the idea to her and she's like, that's it. Only three months. You don't want to go for four months. And I really should get her wow. to talk to you because she could answer these questions better than I can. Partly, I take uh, comfort in the old line that absence makes the heart grow fonder. And I think there is some truth to that. Sure. But it, it's obviously difficult, especially now that I'm a father. I'm just a new father. So I, I've only done a couple of expeditions since he's been around. And the days the days definitely drag. They feel longer than they ever felt before. And it, there's a feeling, a tinge of regret that was never there before. Because all my big expeditions I did was when I wasn't married and when I didn't have um, family. So there's definitely a different dynamic. And it's very hard. And uh, during the day, like, it's strange. During the day, I always feel confident. Like, we can manage it. I'm planning a four-month expedition right now, a four-month solo journey, and that we can make it work. Really? Because it's my job, and what must be done must be done. And that's my wife's position. She's always very practical. She's like, this is our livelihood. This is how we pay our, pay our bills. You have to do expeditions. If you're not doing them, what else are you going to do to make a living? Go sell furniture? Um, this is what you have to do. But I find sometimes when I wake up in the night, because the little baby, my son Thomas, if he's crying or something, I run to his crib to get him. That's when I always get a feeling in the back of my mind. I'm like, oh man, mm. how am I ever going to do an expedition? This is never going to work. I'm never going to be able to go for a month. It'll be agony. It'll be pure torture. I can't do it. But um, I don't know. It's it's the bridge that we're going to have to cross when we come to it. And I've been talking to some of my colleagues at the Royal Canadian Geographical Society who are older than me and they've had kids. So they've been through it before and asking them how they manage it and how they deal with it and hopefully trying to get some insights from them. <laughs> one what of them, have they I was, said? Well, I was just talking to Ray Zahab. I don't know if you know him, but he's a, one of the other exploring residents there and he does ultra marathons. He runs across the Sahara and Siberia and places like that. And he has two daughters who I think are around 11 and nine. And I asked him, hoping that he would have some nugget of wisdom uh, about how to deal with separation for long periods from young children. And he said, it's terrible and there's no getting around it. It's just uh, agony and that's the way it is. And I was like, oh, shoot. I thought there was going to be some uh, something else. But I guess the one thing I can say is that it makes you appreciate the moments that when you are together all the more. So you cherish them more and you make the most of that time uh, when you're together. And it makes it more special when you come back. So uh, that's what I'm doing. And uh, I mean, eventually at some point, it'd be nice if I could figure out a way to do shorter expeditions so that I didn't have to go away for, for as long as I do. So that would be like the ultimate dream yeah. of finding a way not to do as long projects, which I hope. And then maybe when he grows up, he can come with me on some if he's interested into this sort of thing. Sure. Do, how, do you find that being a father and being married have changed your process of risk assessment? Like stuff where before you might go, yeah, worst case scenario here, I die, but it'll be a fairly quick death. Whereas now you're going, eh, I might die, but then I deprive my kid of a father. No, because my secret, my secret is that I've, I've never been much of a risk taker. That's my, that's my secret. Nobody believes it. They're like, no, I don't believe it. But that's my secret. That's how I do all my expeditions is that I don't like taking risks. So every expedition I did, even 10 years ago, I would always err on the side of caution. If I came to some rapids and I was quite confident I could run them, uh, I wouldn't run them if I didn't think it was the right thing to do. I would portage even if it made a, meant a delay. And when I did my journey across the Arctic, even if I felt confident I could do a big water crossing, I wouldn't necessarily do it. I'd be like, nope, I want to err on the side of caution. And one thing I've always done has been super paranoid about lightning. So even if it's clear blue skies, I won't set my tent up on any sort of high ground. I'd be like, nope, I'm not going to risk it, even if the risk is very small. So the funny thing is I'm not really an adrenaline junkie. I love, I love ecology. You know, mm. I, early this morning, I was out in the woods gathering mushrooms. I love teaching people about wild mushrooms and plants and trees. And I have a background in archaeology, which is all about being meticulous and going over things carefully. And I do these expeditions because I love wilderness and these sorts of things. But I'm really not a big uh, adrenaline junkie sort of person personality. I never really have been. So all the expeditions I do are predicated on minimizing risk and being as careful as possible, you know, looking where I put my foot down. So if anything, it probably will reinforce that. But it's not like I was some crazy daredevil doing crazy things like 
obviously no, I, to a certain extent I, risk is inevitable on these journeys but yeah maybe maybe it'll make me even more cautious i, I wasn't implying that you're a, a crazed you know thrill seeker death seeker I, i'm sure you run into people who accuse you of that all the time that's not oh, going yeah, to be for me. sure <laughs> but still you know okay you got to cross a lake I could go the super long way along shore. I could go 20 kilometers across shore, along the shore, or I could do a five kilometer crossing. That's a pretty big crossing. If I go a little bit, I could do, like if I paddle five kilometers that way, I could go a four kilometer crossing. Or a th there's an island. I could, there's still a continuum of choices there, right? You're probably not going to go all the long way around the lake. At some point, you're going to say, okay. I'm going to go here. You could almost quantify it, like how much open water risk are you willing to take? So I'm just wondering if that's been shifted a little bit more towards a conservative. Yeah, well, it hasn't shifted yet. I mean, I was just in the Rockies and we did, we did some pretty difficult things there, crossing rivers and the rapids and climbing. Actually, climbing the mountain that we climbed there was probably one of the most uncomfortable things I ever did because it was during a blizzard. We couldn't see more than three or four feet in any direction. So I guess old habits die hard. And so far, the expeditions I've done as a father have not uh, shifted me fundamentally. But maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe now I'm going to be accused of being a bad father. But I mean, it's certainly I, I want to live to a ripe old age. I don't want to die in the wilderness. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make, make sure that that's the way things go. So yeah, probably I will be more conscious of these risks. But at the end of the day, I can't well, succeed. It's a fascinating. I was just going to say, at the end of the day, I can't succeed unless I take some risks. I mean, I can't minimize everyone. If I minimize all of them, then I might as well not go at all, I guess. A hundred percent. And how many people do you know and how many people do I know who've died in highway accidents? Right. I mean, that, that we, we're willing to accept. We look at your risks and to a much lesser extent, the risks that I take when I'm out in the bush and people go, oh, my God, there are bears there. I'm like, Yeah. But you're driving down a highway without a barrier at 100 kilometers an hour. Another guy that you don't know is coming 100 kilometers an hour the other way. He's four feet from you. And you repeat this all day long, passing strangers. And you know a certain percentage of them are, are on Instagram while they're driving. <laughs> and that's a risk we're willing to take. And we all have infinite proof that there's it's just carnage out there on the highways. Yeah, 100%. My day job's a firefighter, and I, I certainly see that. Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt whatsoever that a Canadian is at far greater risk of dying on a road in a car accident than they are from a bear attack, even if you're a sort of person who goes into bear country camping. And when people ask me what's the most dangerous thing I've ever done, I always say it was the commute I did when I lived in Sudbury in the winter because the roads were terrible. <laughs> and I'd always be doing really? long drives on icy roads. Oh, yeah. Mm. That... I felt much more stressed out about that than any expedition. I'd see cars go off the road all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And and there's much less control, right? I mean, you're driving down the highway. There's either a patch of ice or there isn't. And uh, you don't really have any control about whether the patch of ice is there. And you, you can't go at 10 kilometers an hour. So whereas in the wilderness, you see a dangerous rapid. There are a number of mitigation strategies you can do. Yeah, absolutely. So people always ask bears. I'm sure... The, the first question that you get is, you know, what's the scariest bear encounter that you've had? And I, I realize that you know, your odds of dying when you're in the wilderness from hypothermia are much more than getting eaten by a bear. But indulge me, indulge the listeners. What's the closest or worst bear encounter that you've had? Hopefully it was in your last book. Well, uh, well, I had one even more recently than this, just uh, maybe six weeks ago. I had a mother grizzly with cubs charge me. So... That was, uh, I guess, the, the classic scenario that people fear is coming across a mother grizzly with cubs and having her charge you in thick brush, which happened to me and my friend in the Rockies. But I, I really didn't, I wasn't worried at all. I thought for sure, because I've crossed paths with so many hundreds of bears all the time. I thought for sure that this was a bluff charge and that she was just being defensive. And luckily she was, because they will often do that. Uh, will they charge you and then stop or pull out at the last minute, which is what she did. And when I saw like the cubs, they, the cubs actually kind of charged with her because they're just little cubs and they're following their mom. So when she was charging at us, they were charging too, just running behind her. And I was like, yeah, yeah, there's no way she's actually going to go through. And uh, she, at the last minute, she just sort of pulled off to the right and disappeared into a thicket. There was some spruce. So she kind of went behind that and just sort of slowed her pace down walking. And we just kept walking the other way, you know, nice and nice and calm. No uh, sudden movements and no no use of bear spray or bear bangers and everything was fine. 
So I probably had more threatening bear encounters than that with polar bears and uh, even the odd black bear. And yeah, mostly mostly black bears and polar bears. The odd grizzly is charged, but always bluff charges. But for the most part, I don't worry too much about the bears. I mean, I think that 98% of them are, are, are actually pretty skittish and don't really want to be around me at all. So they run away at the slightest noise. The 2% that aren't, they might be more curious and more aggressive, but they still, I think, are almost hotwired to want to avoid uh, a fight and are more opportunistic. And if you look at the records, as I did, they will often target uh, what they look as the weakest member of the group. There was a few really chilling ones where it'd be a group of like eight or 10 campers. And the bear, the investigators thought, had watched them for a couple of hours, just unseen in the bushes, because bears are remarkably good at remaining out of sight and unnoticed when they want to, as big as they are. And they would sort of wait until maybe a child was separated from the group and went away down to the lakeshore or to the bathroom and then would attack. So, you know, overall, there's pretty clear patterns in bear attacks. And it's something that I obviously am conscious of. I don't want to sound completely cavalier, like there's no danger of bear attacks. But overall, mm-hmm. when you look at the numbers, as we were just talking about with traffic fatalities, the risk is pretty low. And I guess when you're in the wilderness, like I am, there are there are concerns that are always topmost in my mind, which as you alluded to are hypothermia and simply not drowning, especially on those big open water crossings in the Arctic. That's, that's the kind of thing that worries me or that in my tent at night, I'm, you know, sort of a little bit worried about because I know the next morning, I've got a big icy lake to get across and it's could be 100 kilometers. <laughs> and the wind is so powerful, the water is so freezing cold. And there's no avoiding that. So that's the kind of thing that really gives me my white knuckle moments is just getting out in the water. And sometimes, you know, by necessity, you have to go further from shore because if there's shallows or there's rocks and the surf is breaking, sometimes you have to go a little further off land just to ride over the swells. And that's the kind of thing that really worries me. I mean, obviously, I worry a little bit about bears when they're around, but for the most part, they're not really at the top of my mind of the, of the dangers that I'm concerned about. Yeah. Yeah. The The big water crossings and the dealing with the wind and the cold water, like that is everybody you me, Cliff Jacobson, anybody who spent time up north would agree that that is, and, and statistically, that's again, where for every one canoe camper who's been eaten by a bear, there's probably 20 that have drowned in a large lake when the boat overturned in icy cold water. Probably more than that, but I'll go at least 20 to one. Yeah, I'm not sure what the actual numbers would be, but it's certainly a far more potent risk than the relatively small one of getting attacked by a bear. Yeah. Okay. All right, Adam. So your book, where do you get it? My new book, The Whisper on the Night Wind, is available pretty much anywhere books are sold. You can get it on Amazon, Indigo, Chapters, Kohl's, independent bookstores, uh, Barnes and Nobles, any of those places. I know for a limited time, it's 25% off at Indigo and Amazon if you order it. And it's available in all formats. So you can get the hardcover, you can get the ebook or there's an audio edition as well if you prefer to listen to your books if you have long commutes or anything like that. Did you do the audio? Yes, I did. Oh, awesome. Awesome. You I mean, you've got a good storytelling voice, so that that'll be a a bonus. Uh if people want to follow your expeditions or if uh the Arcteryx, the president of Arcteryx wants to get in touch with you, how do they do that? Well, they can find me on my website, uh, adamschultz.com, and there's a contact form there where people can email me. And in terms of social media, I have Instagram and Facebook, so you can find me on there as well. Okay. And I know that you were doing sort of historical and ecological tours in southern Ontario or throughout throughout Ontario this summer. Are you still doing that in the wintertime? So that's something I do annually in September, and I do it at uh, three different locations. Okay in Ontario, Tamagami, Agonquin, and Queenston. And I just teach about wild plants, edible and medicinal plants, mushrooms, and that sort of thing. One of them is more of a history hike, where I talk more about the history of the area. But that's something I do once a year. And if people want to sign up for it, uh, they can send me an email and sign up that way. And they should sign up soon, because I tried to get in on one of them, and uh, you were completely full up. So they, they do sell out, ladies and gentlemen, they do sell out. Yes, they do. They tend to fill up pretty fast. And that's partly because I like to keep them as small groups. So no more than 10 people on a hike. And that just makes it easier when we're looking for mushrooms or plants to gather around them and everyone get up close and ask questions and that kind of thing. Okay. uh, Final question, completely hypothetical. If you had a four month expedition coming up, where would that be? Are you allowed (laughs) to say? 
Uh, I think it's best if I don't say anything yet because I'm still on the fence. Can you give a hint? In Canada. I'm always in Canada. This Can you give a hint? In Canada. In Canada, okay. In Canada. Canada is where I do my exploring, okay. so it'll be definitely be in Canada. Yeah, there aren't that many possibilities. Surely people can All right. maybe figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, best of luck, Adam. And uh, I can't wait to read the book. I know it's on my on its way to me now. And I, I'm always following your expeditions with a great deal of interest. Oh, thank you very much. And it's my pleasure to be back on the show. <laughs>